Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. My new book, Diary of a Psychosis, is out. It's the most lively, devastating baseball bat to the throat takedown of what the public health establishment did in 2020 and beyond that you can imagine. It's my first book in nine years, and you're going to love it. Check it out at diaryofcovid.com. And if you've already bought it, make sure also to visit diaryofcovid.com so you can claim your free bonuses, including my free companion volume, Collateral Damage, a collection of stories from real people who suffered under the restrictions. They weren't allowed to tell their stories at the time, but every one of them told me, we just want to be heard. Check it all out at diaryofcovid.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Tom Woods Show. This is episode 2462 with Paul Gottfried, who is, are you executive editor of Chronicles or just editor? I, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, editor-in-chief. Uh, my uh, associate, uh, Edward Wells, is the executive editor. Okay, okay. Just he wondering. Actually, doesn't, he actually runs the magazine on a daily basis. Okay, okay. It's a great magazine. It's way better than basically any magazine you're thinking of subscribing to. Uh, and it, it is the magazine that published my very first published article a very long time ago. So I, I strongly recommend you get it because, you know, I'm sure you can get an electronic copy, but doggone it, aren't we looking at enough godforsaken screens all day long? Wouldn't you like the old-fashioned pleasure of a physical magazine as you're sitting in your armchair with your pipe or what, however you consume these things? So chroniclesmagazine.org is where you want to go. And not right now. We're talking right now. But after we're done, why don't you go to chroniclesmagazine.org? Uh, Paul has credentials as long as my arm. He's got a Yale PhD. Although I'm telling you, Paul, these Ivy League PhDs that you and I have are are more a source of embarrassment with each passing day. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> It's like, I don't even want to talk about them anymore. So. <laughs> right. we I, got every, I got everything out of them that I'm ever going to get. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, it's been a long time, and I, I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on a, on a whole bunch of things. So I, I haven't really, I guess I didn't really talk to you that. Um, I didn't talk to you during the, uh, let's say, the real heat of the presidential primary. I mean, I guess there wasn't that much heat because we all knew that Trump was going to emerge as the winner. But there was some heat introduced by the uh, the presence of Nikki Haley, <laughs> and by um, the kind of unexpected uh, entrance of of uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, and I'm curious to know, uh, having observed him for the past few months, wh what are your opinions about Vivek? About Vivek or, or Trump or both? Well, Vivek specifically. Yeah, um, I I think he is uh, an extremely um, articulate young man. Uh, his, uh, his his facility, his verbal facility is overwhelming. I mean, sort of like uh, listen to him, and unlike Donald Trump, he actually speaks in whole sentences. He's coherent. Yeah. Um, he's what Trump might be if Trump were of Indian descent uh, and were better educated. Uh, and it more uh, I can't say if, if Trump had more control because with Vivek, I think he's uh, uh, he seems to be carried away by his emotions most of the time. Um, but I, and, and I, I find him a very impressive, uh, young man. And, uh, you know, if he's the Republican nominee, I would vote for him. Uh, but of course he's not going to be the Republican nominee. And, uh, I think he wisely landed, uh, landed up, uh, supporting Trump. I don't think it could hurt him. And, and I think he represents similar populist, uh, a similar populist style. Um, but in my view is able to do it, um, uh, in a much more intelligent way uh, than Donald Trump. <clears throat> well, for example, you probably recall shortly after he conceded and, and dropped out of the race, he apparently was talking to Trump about the danger of central bank digital currencies. Uh -huh. The next day, Trump comes out and says, there will never under me be a central bank digital currency. And he <laughs> appears surprised at the, the loudness of the cheers. So he's, it's like he hadn't realized his base was so interested in this. And he says, wow. Right. You guys right. are all smart people. So we all know what that means. I didn't know what this was yesterday, <laughs> you know, but today I'm, I'm telling you where I stand and I'm glad you're all with me. And I thought, this is both good and bad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, he's easily, he's easily influenced. Um, you know, he, he has a certain image, a certain macho image. Um, 
is uh, the people who like him don't mind the fact that he uh, uh, that, that he sullies the reputation of his enemies, that he speaks uh, in a very vulgar fashion. They probably welcome this. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he is not as well informed about political issues as one might hope. And I remember that, by the way, with, with Vivek, when he mentioned the digital currency, as you know, something a subject that interests me. And uh, no, he did. Uh, he did come out the next day and said, you know, I'm, I'm against this. And so, of course, DeSantis is against this. Most of the other Republicans took positions against uh, against the digital currency. Yeah, but it does it does seem I mean, some of that is that Trump, you know, sat out the debates. So mm-hmm. but but I mean, he probably should know things like that. But mm-hmm. but yeah, I see. I was impressed by Vivek, too. And it was it also the strategy. His strategy was kind of interesting. He's starting off at zero name recognition, which is, I mean, basically an insurmountable obstacle. Zero name recognition. And having a name like Vivek Ramaswamy that doesn't exactly (laughs) roll off the tongue, uh, Mm -hmm. somehow he's got to make himself well-known and liked. And so, you know, so I think in light of the hurdle he was facing, I think he did a a job that he should, he has no reason to be ashamed of. Uh, But also, in terms of his strategy, he did something that I think DeSantis would have been smart to do, but I think he had, my my instinct tells me he had very old-fashioned campaign advisors. Vivek went out of his way to be on my show multiple times, uh, Dave you? Smith's show, um, a whole bunch of these libertarian-type shows, uh-huh. which were just low-hanging fruit. I mean, they weren't low-hanging fruit in that uh, a lot of my listeners and other people, they're just never going to vote for a Republican ever. But some would. Some would consider it. And nobody else even made an attempt to contact us. But he did. He he figured, you know, there. I know that there are people no one else is even going to be reaching out to. Or he went to Porkfest in New Hampshire, and he spoke to the libertarians up there, as did what? RFK Jr., which uh-huh. was also a bold move for RFK Jr. And when the Democratic Party of New Hampshire warned RFK Jr., you better not talk to these people, he wrote a blistering reply about how you are not going to tell me which people I can talk to. So, so I liked I I like people who are going to be mavericks in that way and run things a little bit differently from from how we expect. So by the end, you know, even though I mean, even though you know Vivek probably has some things that I'm not happy with, and his foreign policy isn't exactly the way I would want it. I mm-hmm. feel like his presence in the conversation is without a doubt a net positive. So I, I felt like I had a rooting interest in him by the time all was said and done. Yeah, well, one of the things I found interesting about him is though he's a Hindu, he stressed Christian values. And this was exactly the opposite of the move of, uh, made by Nikki Gurley, who was an evangelical who then went back to uh, uh, emphasizing her Sikh roots. She had a Sikh temple with the husband and this and so forth. And I think Vivek understood that you might get some people on the left who like religious exotica, but most of the people are going to be appealing to are self-identified Christians. And he understood that, you know, and he was always, you know, defending Christians. He said it is, you know, he's, he's a Hinduism and it's really similar to Christianity and so forth. I think that was a very clever move. Um, I, I, think, I think he understood where his base was. Yes, and also when he's, he knew he was going to be asked about that, Mm-hmm. And he knew there's no running away from it. Mm-hmm. So you better just come up with a straightforward reply. Right. You know, rather than be perceived as being a politician trying to wave mm-hmm. it off. Unfor- so, unfortunately, he did not win the nomination, but we didn't expect him to. <laughs> no, we didn't expect him to. I thought there was a chance he could surprise people because of the sheer effort he put into Iowa, driving mm-hmm. through those blizzards. Uh, having more events than everybody else put together. I thought there was some chance. The problem, of course, that he faced was that there was a Donald Trump in, in, in the race. And so mm-hmm. I like mm-hmm. what Vivek saying, but I already have Trump. So why do I need you? Very hard yeah, to overcome I, 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 that. I, yeah, I was actually struck by, I'm struck by how well Nikki Haley has done, considering she seems to be deaf Republican voters. She does all the wrong thing. But yeah. she might have a lot of money behind her. There's media support, uh, at least, you know, Media support uh, that will continue until she gets rid of Trump. I mean, there, there, and uh, there was also some unfortunate interviews that I heard uh, after the New Hampshire primary, in which uh, Democrats who crossed the party lines to support Nikki um, uh, then uh, uh, admitted they would vote for Biden in the general race. 
Yeah, so I mean, that's would, part of the explanation. That's part of right. why she's doing well. <laughs> yeah, she's getting a lot of democratic support. <laughs> but she, you know, she she's done well at holding on to that base, but she's not doing very well in picking up Republican uh yeah. supporters. And you never in your life you never run into a Nikki Haley supporter. In fact, well, she on Twitter, she shared a couple of what it was laughable. They were supposed to be screenshots of emails that supporters had written to her. And they were so fake, both in the way they looked and in the things they said. No one would say these things about Nikki Haley. Right, right. You know, so. Now, and, and you wonder whether these polls are, are accurately depicting or ac- actually reflecting her popularity. Or, um, I really don't believe she's eight points ahead of Biden, which is about 10 points ahead. Would you rather a lot of Democrats saying they'd vote for for Nikki Haley? Uh, and many of them may not want to, may not turn out to vote for her uh, if she if she's a Republican nominee. So I I, th- I think it's hyped up and fleeted support that she has right now, and this may be even true of the polls that show her running away with the race. Well, by the time this airs, the 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 thing will probably be uh, more or less moot anyway. Right. But I did like the way. I mean, I thought I thought Vivek handled her really well. Well, I do too. <laughs> And he, he got her flustered and he, he, you know, and, and that whole thing about asking her to name Ukrainian provinces, you know, <laughs> th- that was, I liked his point there, which is that well, I think Americans have been kind of spellbound by this idea that the foreign policy elite has insights that they don't have uh-huh. and, and they understand why we need to intervene in X, Y, and Z place. And so if you expose them as being the dumb dumbs that most of them are, that helps. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I agree that, uh, you know, it, it, there, there was a kind of rhetorical support for the Ukrainian cause, but these people seem to know very little about what's going on in Ukraine, unless it comes from neoconservative approved sources. I right. mean, pick up the New York Post every day, and these people are reporting from Ukraine or in the pocket of the Ukrainian government or in the, or in the pocket of the neocons. And uh, it's just, so we have to do this, and there's only five more minutes uh, uh, in which we, which we can show the Ukraine if we wait to, you know, to send them $100 billion tomorrow, they're going to fall to, to Russia rule. I have to say that Marco Rubio surprised me by saying that this will have to be settled. They have to make some kind of peace and nobody's going to get, neither side will get what it wants fully. Um, because that, that is the way, that, that's the only way it can end. I mean, yeah. otherwise the war will go on and on forever. Um, and, and, uh, I, I do think it's outrageous that the people who are hysterically, uh, concerned with Ukraine's Eastern border don't give a damn about borders in the United States. No, in fact, that's delighted to have all the illegals coming because they're going to vote for the Democratic Party. Hey everybody, I know a lot of you are tired of being under the thumb of big tech, but the question is, what are you going to do about it? Well, how about not using their quote unquote free tools? Yeah, they offer you these free tools because they're harvesting your data and manipulating you as a consumer. Federated Computer, on the other hand, offers a full replacement for Google, Microsoft Office 365, Slack, Zoom, and more for people who care about privacy and, you know, not being treated like cattle. Everything is encrypted end-to-end, fully backed up daily, so we're talking private email, file storage, team chat, WordPress hosting, CRM, help desk, email marketing tools, and more all bundled up into one easy monthly subscription. You get unlimited users without your price going up and fantastic customer support from, get this, actual human beings. Their solutions are powered by open source software so you can take your data wherever you like, whenever you like. So visit federated.computer slash woods today for your free 30-day trial. So how about that? A company that thinks its job is to you know, provide you with services instead of spying on you or shutting you up or manipulating you. So take your first step toward digital freedom. Visit federated.computer slash woods today for your free 30-day trial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, it reminds me of the speech. Um, and he used to write for Chronicles. Maybe he still does. Bill Kaufman, you know him? Oh, yeah, he used to write yeah. for us. Yeah. Where- So Bill gave a speech at Ron Paul's rally for the Republic in 2008. And he was saying that basically there are two Americas, but they're not Democrats and Republicans. They're people who, and he, this is, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but he was saying that you can't care about Baghdad and your own backyard. 
you really at some level have to choose. And mm -hmm. McCain, who was the nominee in 2008, he said, uh, choose his Baghdad. And then, <laughs> and then Bill goes into this flowery thing, well, we stand uh, in our backyards, on our front porches, in mm -hmm. Sandlot baseball diamonds and volunteer <laughs> fire departments and rock and roll clubs and, you know, all that stuff about the little, <laughs> little institutions of the real America. Mm -hmm. And when you say that oh, these people care nothing about borders of the U.S., but they care about Ukraine, that's, that's exactly what Bill was talking about. Yeah. They have no connection to the real America. Yeah, I, 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 you know, you, you hear from uh, some of the Republican warmongers um, that, you know, we're actually concerned about both. Well, they're not, you know, the, 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 the point is that uh, you may have to choose in the end uh, because the, the other side was not interested. The Democrats are not interested in both. You know, they want open borders to get more Democratic voters, and they want to get hundreds of billions of dollars to this lost cause in Ukraine. Um, so, so at the end of the day, you may have to choose between the two. <laughs> yeah, yes, indeed, indeed. Well, let me ask you about an article you have on uh, The Blaze. And I'm not asking you about this article exclusively because it's behind a paywall and I'm too much of a cheapskate to pay to read it. <laughs> but that is a little bit of the reason. But in We're, this article, you're talking about a person whose name has come up here and there, you know, in amid some of these murmurings about Biden's cognitive abilities and whether he's fit for the office and some concerns that Democrats have. And of course, the name is Michelle Obama. <laughs> And I've heard a lot of Republicans say that she would be a formidable uh, mm -hmm. opponent. For, and we can, we can think of a number of reasons that would be the case. But what's your opinion? Well, I had a piece this morning saying that she would not be as formidable an opponent as some of the Democrats and Republicans uh, uh, might believe at this time. She, she is so offensive. As I say, she is a younger black version of Hillary Clinton. And that may be paying her too much of a compliment. Um, what I'd argue is that, you know, the fact that she's the most respected woman in the world in 2020, according to the Gallup poll, means absolutely nothing. Uh, since you only get 10% of people responding to this poll, I was not asked, no, I, I, I suspect you weren't asked to, to respond to it, but only 10% supported her, 6% uh, supported Kamala Harris, 4% supported Melania Trump. Um, then, of course, there's the other 90%, you know, all over the, all over the place. Uh, most most of the interviews with her are uh, done by people who, uh, uh, you know, just just lob softballs or these uh, uh, paper balls, whatever we call them, at her. They, they do not ask serious questions. So she has Oprah Winfrey and Joy Reid and, and these other um, black uh, female uh, feminists. They've said, you know, inviting her on and, and convinced her she's a wonderful person. But there, there was there was I remember. A piece of, of news that got away, and the media didn't try to suppress it in the end. It was it, 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 it was just something that anybody who saw it would be turned off to uh, Michelle. She was uh, saying that people in Washington are racist and sexist because when she walks her dog, even if they pet her dog, they do not address her. They don't speak to her. And she went on. I think she wrote a similar piece about being uh, in Martha's Vineyard which is an immaculately leftist uh, island. <laughs> yeah. um, but she, she obviously feels entitled. She's arrogant, stupid. Uh, I see no evidence of intelligence in that woman. Uh, and uh, although her husband uh, plays the race card and tells us we're systemic white racist, he does have a certain charm, uh, uh, Barack. She has none. And I, you know, she, she will start with... Uh, sort of a hardcore Democratic base if she were the nominee. I don't see her, actually, I don't see her winning, even against Trump. Well, so let's say a little something about Trump. And I, I know like, we're going to be tired. Of, I'm already tired of this now. And we have a whole, right. you know, X months to, to go here. But mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like you and I have talked about this since 2016, because we were, I was wondering then, do you think after Trump, let's say, serves a term, that the Republican Party will just go back to being Mitt Romney. And I think you and I were, were more I uh, pessimistic than we should have been about that. Because I, no, I, think, I, I, th I, think, I think you're right. Uh, I, I think that force is much more powerful than was often give it credit for being. Uh, New York Post, Wall Street Journal, uh, there, there, there is, uh, the, the Murdoch media empire is controlled by neoconservatives uh, and, and by rhinos so-called rhinos, um, 
and so is National Review, obviously. Um, they, 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 they do have a lot of real estate. You know, the, uh, uh, the regular Republicans, big business Republicans, the liberal uh, internationalist interventionists and so forth. And I think there's a good chance that uh, Trump will not change the party irreversibly. Um, and that, you know, once he's gone, they could well go back to uh, nominating. I, I don't mean Nikki Haley. I mean, I think by now she's pretty much destroyed herself. I mean, it, it could be a figure like Nikki Haley uh, who gets the nomination once Trump is gone. Now, that's now, by, interesting. By the way, well, another thing that I, I might mention is that, you know, all these uh, populists are uh, uh, screaming hurrah, hurrah, because Mitch McConnell is stepping down. In all likelihood, he'll be replaced by somebody like John Cornyn of Texas, who's a liberal Republican. They're, they're, they're not going to put a right-wing Republican uh, in Mitch McConnell's position. It's highly unlikely that would happen. Oh, we've been hearing a lot about uh, Javier Milei in Argentina and mm -hmm. all the things that he's done. Like from from the, the moment he stepped into office, he's been taking action. He's slashing this and abolishing that and saying that... Uh, Political campaigns have to be funded by voluntary contributions now, like whatever. He's, whatever he's done, he's done a lot of it. And so people, Vivek included, have said, uh, there's no reason we can't duplicate what he's doing uh -huh. in the U.S. Um, but I don't know. Do you, do you feel that way? I feel like he's able to do that in Argentina because people have reached a point where um, they feel like the, the people in the bow ties and the fancy suits have had their chance. Well, uh -huh. And we have triple digit inflation. And so we're willing to consider radical alternatives. I don't know how radical alternatives Americans are prepared to accept. Yeah, I, I, I don't think they're ready for that. I mean, if you noticed uh, when uh, DeSantis suggested we might want to raise the, uh, the, um, the age for, uh, for qualifying for Social Security to 70, there was, there was quite a backlash. And Trump assured everybody that all the entitlement programs would mean Intact, no changes that will be made, and so forth. Um, much of the populist base of the United States uh, represent that view. They they do not want uh, uh, to slash budgets if it affects their entitlement programs. Right. So I I don't think we are at the. Of course, in Argentina, you're dealing with double digit inflation, all kinds of problems. They've been going on for some time. They've beggared people. We have not yet reached that point in the United States even with all the disastrous policies pursued by the Biden administration. A lot of times, at least in my lifetime, it, it seems like we hear this year's presidential election is the most important in history. Mm -hmm. The survival of America is at stake. Now, it's hard to make that case when it's Bill Clinton versus Bob Dole. Sure. You know, <laughs> but I will say that there is rather more of a difference between Joe Biden and Donald Trump than there was between mm -hmm. Clinton and Dole. But how do you evaluate that kind of claim that people make all the time? Do you think this actually is the most important election? If not, uh, what would be another, another semi-recent one that was as important? No, I agree. I, I think this is the last chance to turn back the totalitarian and left in this country, or at least um, uh, restrain them somewhat. Um, I think if Joe Biden wins, uh, and uh, more illegals come into the country. They will be quickly enfranchised, or they certainly will count toward the, uh, the census, congressional census. Um, they'll be given all kinds of benefits. They will, they will be wined and dined by the Democratic Party. Uh, there, will be, there will be efforts made to bring Puerto Rico and Washington into the, uh, in, in as, uh, uh, as a 51st and 52nd state. They will try to pack the Supreme Court. All the things that the Democrats we're planning to do, they will do. Um, I think this may be, and of course, they'll also nationalize the, um, uh, the, the voting procedures in such a way that it'll be impossible for anybody but leftists to, uh, uh, to, to, to win the presidency in the future. Um, I think it could be very dangerous. If the, it's, it's, not, it's not that Trump you know, is our savior. I think Trump is uh, a profoundly flawed figure. Uh, in many ways, a thoroughly unprincipled individual, but he is the best that we, the best we have right now, uh, if we're looking for somebody to stop the to stop the Democrats. My dear Tom Woodshow listener, you know that in our day and age, we are faced with information overload 
But don't you worry, all woods here has an excellent way to deal with it. With the Blinkist app, you can absorb huge amounts of information in 27 nonfiction categories. So we're talking history, philosophy, parenting, career, technology, religion, and on and on. Blinkist condenses each book into 15-minute summaries you can read or listen to. So if you have a half-hour commute each way, you can absorb the equivalent of four books. You think that might make you a more impressive person? Among the thousands and thousands of titles at Blinkist, you'll find libertarian classics, Rothbard, Friedman, dare I say, even Woods, your very own host here. Well, right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your seven-day free trial and get 40% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 40% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. And now for a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account. You'll get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. Wow. Uh, I mean, I'm, my instinct tells me the same kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Because what else, what, what else is the reason for um, importing all these people? Is, is it really that they, their hearts are moved <laughs> by their plight at home? I mean, come on. Well, these I people... That. These well, people are, are, who would, why, why will they not... Uh, you know, deport people who have raped in Stalin and committed crimes because they're future Democratic voters. That's why they won't throw them out. Yeah, yeah. It's very obvious mean, what they're doing. And what, what bothers me about this is even the Republican, the Fox News, Republic, it took them like years to come around to the obvious. You know, the, the, uh, I think they were, they were thinking they might be able to recruit these people if they stay as future Republican voters. Uh, so hope springs eternal for them. But uh, that's obviously the the only the only reason that I can think of, you know, why why they're giving free medical corner and all kinds of other things. They're they're being cultivated as democratic voters. Well, I, you know, I I don't like to be um, I don't like to exaggerate. I I don't like to go over the top. I mean, I'm, I'll, let me give you an example. I have a, a guy who was on the show earlier this week. He's from the UK, Dominic Frisby, and he said, you know, the thing is. If you really want to get a lot of attention, you'll say something in the financial press like, I think gold is going to 10,000, or I think Bitcoin will be at 150,000 within two mm-hmm. months, or something, and something like that. Whereas somebody who says, well, you know, it'll have a slow but steady rise, and it'll probably pull back a little, you know, no one cares about that, you know, so the more sensational you can be, the better. And I try not to, to, to be that way, mm-hmm. but I... I do, even though it, it sounds sensationalistic, it also happens to be, I think, probably correct what you've just said. And so let's suppose that the unthinkable happens and Joe Biden gets reelected. Now, um, you know, you and I are, let's say, if I may say so, Paul, oh, you know, a, a touch over the hill. <laughs> but how would you advise, uh, let's say, young people just starting out in their early 20s? What should they do? Should they leave? What should they do? Well, what, what, one of the possible strategies for dealing with the effect is to move into a red state or a state that's still red. I mean, I don't, I don't, by the time they franchise the illegals in Texas, it'll probably be a blue state. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, there, there, there are some parts of the country um, that have not been taken over by the radical left um, and by the, uh, the deep state. Uh, and I think people should move into those areas. I think one chance to resist or one possibility of resisting is to be moving to areas that are solidly conservative and doing whatever one can to resist the directives of the federal government, uh, undermining them, doing whatever. And, and I think the more and more, I mean, the, the, the strategy obviously pursued by the Confederacy did not work. I, there were 700,000 people dying in a, in a civil war, but, and, uh, you know, the, the, the chances of survival for the right would be probably be even worse than they were in 18, you know, than they were for the South in the, in the, in the 1860s. But there, there is a possibility of doing what Abbott is doing in Texas, right, which is defying the federal government, but doing it in a way that is clearly constitutional. Right? I mean, everybody sees states do have a right to resist an invasion. You know? Yeah. And uh, he's, he's going to win on this. Um, I'm not sure the Republicans can win this race. Uh, according to the polls that I'm looking at, uh, Trump is only two points ahead 
of Biden in, in the poll, and, you, you, and all the reliable polls I'm seeing, even though Biden is enormously unpopular, his numbers are well below, uh, you know, well below water level, and they're it's only has thirty eight percent acceptability, whatever it is. Trump is not doing very well, except among Republicans. Uh, uh, the last poll I saw here, Trump was picking up 47% of the vote and Biden 45% of the vote. Yeah. Uh, this is what everybody was afraid of. Because it was cheat and give more percentage. Right. right. But I mean, this is what everybody was afraid of. He's done nothing. All he's done is alienate people further. He's done right. nothing to. And the thing is, you can make a, a one minute elevator pitch about the absolute insanity of 2024 America, that in your heart, you know, I'm right. You yeah, know, if I may borrow a phrase, you know, I'm right. That I don't care if you even think of yourself as a Democrat. There are a lot of you Democrats who think this whole gender pronoun thing is crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, you think you, you know, you, you didn't, you weren't quite sure about all that COVID stuff either. Uh, you, you, you don't want to transform your whole life because of quote unquote climate change. Like, change you like you know something is seriously wrong and you know you don't have to like me you don't have to like me mm -hmm. but i'm mm -hmm. gonna try to hold this off for a little while mm -hmm. i mean what wow well, at least try <laughs> you know mm -hmm. i mean it'll, if, if you can't speak extemporaneously then memorize it and and just keep right. giving it or send vivek all over the country to give the damn speech no i about, agree i know? agree right right DeSantis or vivek either one would would have been fine i mean they would have uh you know, provided the same populist message uh, in, in whole sentences, you're coherent, it would have addressed the issues that you mentioned. Uh, you're not going to get this out of Trump. It's just that, you know, Nikki Haley is a bird brain and uh, I'm the yeah. greatest guy. And so uh, I have no idea how people can stand listening to him. And I, I see this as a right winger <laughs> and as somebody who favors the populace. Ray, you, uh, you are not a quote unquote never Trumper in the neocon sense at all. No, absolutely not. And I do. So if you're annoyed, Trump. then what does that mean? <laughs> yes. You're, you're, you're like uh, ultra right winger I'm Paul annoyed. Godfrey, for heaven's sake. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> all right. So we'll, we'll see. What, what, tell me what, um, what's been cooking at Chronicles lately? What kind of issues you guys are writing about? Well, I don't know. We, we have an uh, issue on the end of Ruberwood. So Ruberwood's a new. 19th century bourgeois liberalism. Yes, Winter right. Liberalism. <laughs> yeah. Why, why it is ending. Uh, and what, you know, what, what will we place it? Uh, we have an issue on anti-white racism, which is coming up in May. Um, I know that we also have an issue on NATO. Um, that, that the, I think the issue on, I think we, we had several articles on NATO. Uh, you had several articles on NATO this month. That was the March issue. Um, and we're, we're planning other issues with equally provocative themes. Uh, and we generally just plan three months ahead. So we're almost at the end of the three month period. We'll have to plan three more. Three more. Yeah. Well, I'll, I do, I've been doing, since I added the mm -hmm. video element, I've been doing three episodes a week. And so it's like the end of every week, it's, oh my gosh, I have to plan three more of these things. Does this ever end? They just, there is to go on and on. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and fortunately, we you know we we have enough people with imagination <laughs> for future issues. Uh, the issues are not all that different. Is we generally have the same the same people writing for us, you know, our editors and our regular contributors and uh, our book reviewers and so forth. Uh, but we do try to vary the theme. Yeah, you know. Uh, but if, I find even when we we have uh, what Ed calls no theme issues, they look pretty much the same as the thematic issues. Yeah. So those end up. <laughs> Having several articles on the same theme, so at the last moment we decided it's a thematic issue. Well, it is very much an intellectual pleasure, let's say, to mm -hmm. to read Chronicles magazine. Uh, and so I'm gonna again. I I don't get any. I'm not getting any kickback from Paul Godfrey when I say this. It's just that it mm -hmm. it hold, Not only do I enjoy it, but it holds sentimental value for me because I think back mm -hmm. to those years when, in fact, Murray Rothbard recommended that I read Chronicles. So yes. how about that? Yes, so, yeah, that's. Well, he, he was a, a, a revered figure at Chronicles Magazine, you know, back in the 1980s and early 1990s. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. He, he, he was published in there. So chroniclesmagazine.org is the website. So, well, Paul, uh, it's looking pretty grim, but... Uh, it always looks grim. <laughs> I know. That is the lesson, isn't it? It's grimmer now than it was last year. I know. Year so, before. 
Start thinking about other countries, people. And uh, <laughs> Paul, I appreciate you so much and your time today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.